We have today with us Silvia Bunge, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Berkeley. She had a, his, her PhD in Stanford University and then moved to the MIT for a postdoc. Actually, you've been educated in the some of best universities in the world, and certainly this is the, the result. Welcome here. We really uh, know you as one of the leading and youngest figures in the field of uh, cognitive development and mostly cognitive brain development. And you are certainly among the peer pioneers of this field, aren't you? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to ask you several questions that I hope you answer. The first one is, now that we know more about brain development, how do you think that brain development can contribute, you know, or add knowledge to the cognitive psychological development of children? Ultimately, what we want to understand is how the child comes to emerge into adulthood, how he or she takes on the adult roles and uh, changes in cognitive and social-emotional functioning. But all the levels of analysis that culminate in this behavior are really important to study because complex behaviors don't rely on just one elemental function. They're the, the sum of many different functions. And so all of these different levels of analysis have to be studied. At the end of the day, for me, it's deeply unsatisfying to just uh, try to describe at the surface level what is going on. I think we need to drill down to the underlying mechanisms. Good. So an analogy would be, uh, if you want to understand why a Porsche is faster than a Volvo, Yes, you could describe how fast they both are, but you want to understand, you want to get in there and see what is the difference in their engines, their wheels, um, and more importantly, perhaps, uh, is the clinical relevance. If we want to understand neurodevelopmental disorders, it's not enough to say that the car has stopped. We want to understand why before we can begin to make a change. There is a, a question in psychology for many, many years, having to do with the relationship between genes and environment, the so-called nature-nurture controversy. What's your opinion about that? I'm frankly surprised that this debate is still alive. Uh, we know a lot now about the, the rising field of epigenetics, how it is that genes get expressed um, genes aren't expressed in a vacuum. They get turned on or off or up or down by environmental factors. Uh, and so, for example, the behavioral genetics concept of heritability is actually kind of flawed because it doesn't take into account these complex interactions. So there's an older study by Eric Turkheimer that was very influential in my thinking, and this was showing that, yes, uh, IQ is highly heritable if you compare monozygotic and dizygotic twins from a high socioeconomic background. But when you look at children, twins also from a low socioeconomic background in the United States, heritability is, has a very low estimate and all of this uh, difference is driven by the environment. Another question that also lacks now in the, in the intellectual environment has to do with, uh, you know, the evolution of mind. And somehow we all know that uh, many factors have contributed to the building of the brain, so to speak. You have some research and some ideas that I would like you to explain now because do you think that there is any particular structure or network in the brain that somehow can, lead, can give us a lead 
about uh, how the human brain evolved as human. So I'm fascinated by this question, in particular, how is it that humans can reason so well and so flexible, uh, flexibly in comparison to other primate species? And of course, one huge change is the evolution of language, the language network of the brain. But what I study is reasoning, and uh, I've been very interested in this. Um, it's a frontoparietal network. Uh, it's a region in parietal cortex that uh, seems to have a direct projection in humans to an anterior part of the brain that seems not to be, this connection seems not to be present in other non-human primates. And so we've been studying this brain network uh, and also the expansion of this anterior part of the brain that is the one in humans that, whose cells have the largest dendritic arbors. They can integrate information from many other neurons. And in humans, it seems as though these neurons are spaced further apart from each other than they are in non-human primates. There's the same number of cells, roughly, but the density is much lower, meaning there's more room for integrating information. And we think that that, uh, as well as the um, rise of this new connection with parietal cortex, can give rise to uh, improved ability to make relations between mental representations that I think is fundamental to language, to um, reasoning, to decision making. Uh, that's very interesting. Well, my last question is, uh, what are for you the big questions for the future in your field? Most of the research up to now in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience has been on weird participants, meaning Western, educated, industrialized, rich nations. And so that is a very small slice of life. This is a very small slice of the, the wide array of cultures and countries that humans live in. And we know nothing really about possible cultural differences or cultural influences on the developing brain. Are there any differences in the trajectory or the speed of change in specific brain networks that can be explained by these environmental differences? Well, thank you very much.